Hi, I'm Rahil Filippos and you are listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. In this episode, we talk about the rise in crypto cyber frauds in India. We also quickly go over a US State Department report which flagged human rights issues in India. But first, we talk about the fugitive jeweler Mehul Choksi, who along with his nephew Nirav Modi, are known for defrauding the Punjab National Bank out of 13,500 crore rupees. In 2018, just before the CBI registered a case against Choksi, the jeweler had fled to Antigua and Barbuda. and the investigation bureau has been trying to extradite him since then to help the cbi do that the interpol had issued a red corridor notice against him but recently the interpol withdrew the red notice and it was withdrawn after choksi appealed against it to know how his withdrawal will impact the cbi's case against choksi the indian express's deeptiman tiwari joins us in this segment So Deepthiman can you first briefly tell us about the case against Mehul Choksi for which the Interpol had issued a notice against him The Mehul Choksi case is basically the Punjab National Bank loan fraud case which was registered by the CBI in in uh, 2018 early 2018 and uh, this case is actually about uh, companies owned by Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi both very known uh, faces in the diamond industry diamond jewelry industry and uh, both what they did was they took huge massive amounts of loans from uh, punjab national bank and they fraudulently tried to repay their earlier loans with the loans that they had taken now and they kept circulating the money like this for a long time with eventually no plan to actually pay the bank and they diverted funds for their personal purposes to offshore accounts and all kinds of things which happened which actually led to massive losses for punjab national bank to the tune of more than rupees 13500 crores and uh, in fact mehul choksi was even selling fake diamonds as it was found later because after the enforcement directorate made attachments of his businesses and found the diamonds it was actually worthless so even enough recoveries couldn't be made out of his business through attachments so that's how they were running this uh, business and both of them both nirav modi and uh, mehul choksi fled the country just before this fir was registered by cbi following which both cbi and ed had to uh, get red corner notices issued against them to the interpol and could you explain to us what this red notice issued by the interpol actually does and how was it supposed to help the cbi so first of all interpol is an international police body which is formed with the collaboration of various countries across the world and all countries have their representatives in interpol this is basically to have greater cooperation between uh, different countries on policing matters especially when people run away from one country and go to another country and go out of the jurisdiction of one nations police force so in this what happens is that when for top criminals who have uh, been accused of serious offenses the interpol issues a red notice a red notice means that anywhere across the country whichever countries are associated with the interpol wherever this person goes it is the duty of that country's police force to find him and apprehend him and then send it back to the country where he is wanted so uh, that is why red notices are issued and to get a red notice issued you have to convince a committee in the interpol that you have a cogent case against this person you have to share some evidence where they have to be satisfied that you have a case generally agencies file a charge sheet and send it to interpol you have to also make sure that the interpol is convinced that you know this person is not being uh, hunted down for political reasons or for you know showing some kind of dissent to the government or he is not just being falsely persecuted so all those things are done in the documents that are sent to the interpol where evidence is shown and you know the seriousness of the crime is uh, given to the interpol so yeah that's basically the process 
Right. So that would mean that when the Interpol issued the red notice, they were convinced about the charges against Choksi. But since then, Deepriman, what changed? Why has the Interpol withdrawn the notice now? Okay, let's understand that a red notice was first issued against Mayul Choksi Niro Modi. After that, extradition requests were sent to Antigua, where Mayul Choksi had taken citizenship even before the CBI had registered an FIR and uh, has been there since. And uh, Nero Modi is in the UK. So in both the countries, extradition pr- proceedings are going on. While these extradition proceedings were pending, there are allegations that India's external intelligence agency tried to get Mehul Choksi back to India in extrajudicial ways. Now, we all know that in May 2021, Mehul Choksi suddenly appeared on the shores of Dominica, where he was put under arrest and a flight, a jet from India carrying CBI officials and Ministry of External Affairs officials went to Dominica to get him back to India. This is something that is on record. Later, what the legal team of Mehul Choksi did was it found evidence that there were three people involved in actually kidnapping Mehul Choksi from Antigua, bundling him into a yacht and bringing him to Dominica with the aim of getting him deported to India so that he wouldn't have to go through extradition proceedings anywhere because it would be a quicker way of bringing him to India. However, the entire thing got leaked to the local media and after that, the Dominican authorities had to put Mehul Choksi under arrest for illegal entry into the country. It was revealed that Mehul Choksi was trapped by a Hungarian woman named Barbara Yarabek and two alleged Indian agents, Gurmeet Singh and Gurjit Bhandal, uh, bundled him in a yard, beat him up and took him to Dominica before this entire thing unraveled. So, uh, on these grounds, Mehul Choksi petitioned the Interpol that look where you are attempting to arrest and send me back to is a place which kidnaps people and tries to get them in extrajudicial ways. And this led to the Interpol saying that yes, there is credible evidence to the fact that an attempt to kidnap you was made. And there are risks that Mehul Choksi may not receive a fair trial in India. So on these grounds, the red notice has been removed against Mehul Choksi. Right. And how does this affect the CBI's case against Choksi and their attempts to get him back, especially considering how crucial the PNB fraud case is for the country? It's in many ways a major, major setback for the CBI and for India to get Mehul Choksi back. Because uh, you see, the kind of concerns that have been raised by Interpol while removing this red notice are something that are going to be used by Mehul Choksi's defense in the extradition proceedings as well. And let's remember, in extradition proceedings, the possibility of a fair trial in the country that the person is going to be sent to is a major, major concern. And almost all extradition proceedings, you know, take into account this, whether the person is being persecuted for political reasons or the person will have his human rights violated when he reaches there, whether he will get humane accommodation in a jail. Well, and most importantly, whether the person will get a fair trial. Now, this issue of his alleged kidnapping is going to be raised by his defense in extradition proceedings. And it could be very, very difficult for India to convince courts there that he will get a fair trial in India. But I'm sure India will use all its diplomatic heft. And it does have a cogent case. That is beyond doubt that Mehul Choksi is a fraudster. Mehul Choksi is a fugitive economic offender and he needs to be brought back to India. So it does have a cogent case. But yes, it's, uh, let's say, it's eagerness to bring him back early without following due judicial process may have put some roadblocks in this process. Okay, and apart from India using its diplomatic ties to extradite Choksi, Do we know if the CBI has any other avenues or options to convince the Interpol in helping them? 
So the options that CBI has is petition the Interpol once again, petition it to reinstate the red notice against him. Or there are more cases against uh, Mehul Choksi, one that was registered only last year. So CBI can seek a red notice in connection with that case because that is a fresh case. So all this can be done. Despite that, even without a red notice, you know, extradition proceedings can go on and India can continue to follow uh, its extradition proceedings in the Antigone court. So, of course, a lot of it depends upon the diplomacy between two countries. So, India will definitely use its diplomatic heft as well. And next we talk about cryptocurrency frauds. Sometime last year, a young software developer in Bengaluru received a message from a wrong number. But the person at the other end kept chatting with him. And they slowly became virtual friends. The person who first sent him the message said that she's a crypto expert and could help him make money. And all he had to do was use the app and website she used for her investments. When he finally did invest, the website showed that his money had grown multiple folds. Later, the man and his girlfriend invested a lot more money into the website. They even took giant loans and together invested 59 lakhs into the site, which included their savings as well. But then one day, it all suddenly vanished. This is just one of the hundreds of crypto trading frauds worth rupees 70 crore in total that occurred last year in Bengaluru alone. In this segment, the Indian Express's Kiran Parashar joins my colleague Anvati Singh to talk about the rise in crypto cyber frauds and what makes them possible. So Kiran, before we talk about these crypto scams, could you please explain some of the most common cyber financial crimes in India? So cyber crimes in India is one of the major and thriving crimes across the country. It is just that there are few states which have mechanism to report and uh, many states are yet to reach that level where they provide fa- or facilitate public to report uh, cyber crimes. According to the government data, India report uh, about uh, 13.9 lakh cyber security incidents were reported in 2022. And when, when it comes to cryptocurrency frauds in Bangalore in particular, in 2022, the people who lost money in cryptocurrency scams was around 70 crores. So in 2022, Bengaluru lost 270 crores for cyber crime. In that 70 crores was related to uh, cryptocurrency frauds. So that amounts to 25% of the total cyber crime amount was lost in cryptocurrency trade. So other cyber crimes where people lose money are generally phishing and like it might be internet banking and uh, this matrimonial frauds other than that you get this OTP frauds and job related frauds all these kinds. Uh, Cryptocurrency post COVID-19 has been um, uh, the rise of cryptocurrencies and also the uh, frauds related to cryptocurrency has increased post-COVID and we are seeing a very drastic increase in cyber crimes which are related to cryptocurrency frauds. Okay, so we see that cryptocurrency fraud is happening at a large scale right now. So that must also mean that there is a substantial share of crypto investors in India? So according to an estimate in August uh, August last year, according to uh, KuCoin, a global cryptocurrency exchange, there were around 115 million cryptocurrency investors in India. So you can see the magnitude of cryptocurrency investors in the country. So this is where the number stands. And could you tell us the reason behind such a rise in crypto investments in the country? So when COVID-19 lockdown was announced, if you see the Indian markets, the Indian stock market crashed then. So then a uh, People wanted to invest money, but there was no platform where they could invest and they could get a potential place where they could get a good returns. So cryptocurrency was a place where people could invest money and get get back. And at the same time, if you see, then Elon Musk started uh, tweeting about uh, Tesla CEO and Twitter CEO. 
Elon Musk started tweeting about cryptocurrencies and also in March 2021 if you remember he tweeted that uh, people can buy Tesla cars through by paying bitcoins so there were a lot of positive messages that were coming which helped uh, a cryptocurrency to thrive for example i'll give you just an instance so the cryptocurrency one cryptocurrency worth was around 23 lakhs in january 2021 so by april 2021 one bitcoin price was at 41 lakh 89000 so you can imagine the kind of growth it almost doubled in a matter of 2 or 3 months so this was where people started investing and even like there were some of the uh, ne- negative comments uh, against cryptocurrencies regulations became a big concern then the market fell again in july 2021 the, the cryptocurrencies again came back to 23 lakhs in july but again it bounced back to 47 lakhs in november 2021 so the volatility of the market also was one of the reasons that people started investing because the, like if you can see it doubled in less than 5 6 months for in the second uh, when it uh, increased second time so uh, there was huge volatility in the market and there was high chances that your 10 rupees could become 100 rupees 200 300 rupees in a day or even in few minutes and the cyber criminals basically other than sending whatsapp messages and other things they also use social media uh, websites like instagram facebook and also youtube to promote their channels uh, to promote their business uh, or to promote the cyber crimes they used all these models and also you have to keep in mind that during lockdown people started using uh, internet uh, or people were more dependent on internet youtube and uh, social media for the uh, as their source of information so these all somehow contributed people for the investment in cryptocurrency right and coming to the point about crypto frauds you mentioned how social media was used by scammers but apart from that can you tell us some of the most common methods used to scam people so uh, this is one kind of one modus operandi and the cyber experts have termed it called pig butchering scam or romance scam so basically in this what they do is say they initially send bulk messages just like any phishing scam that you get messages otp otp fraud messages on your mobile phone these people send uh, messages on whatsapp or uh, even on uh, normal text messages you get it so when they send the bulk messages either one or two people will respond so people who respond to them they try to build a trust over a period of time it might be one week two weeks one month two month they kind of build a trust so after building trust what they do is they start siphoning money and what they do is they make these people to buy cryptocurrencies and to invest in a, in a website a web portal which they have opened where the victim thinks that it's a, a website where uh, which is very legal and genuine but it it would be taken down and there are even uh, people who create uh, mobile applications and place that in play store on android applications but uh, after a while they'll take it down there have been lot of cases that people do in that way but kiran one would assume app stores to have some sort of filters right how is it possible that apps can just take your money and vanish so the problem with the app stores uh, or play store all this the problem is that you won't have lot of regulations or uh, problems to upload a, a app in play store uh, but when people start to report then uh, the play store will take down the app but the damage will be done by then so even when people start to report more in numbers then play store will take action they will remove it or they will uh, take down the app application but by then like major damage will be done right and can you tell us why so many people are falling for these scams especially considering the fact that we have so many awareness campaigns regarding common bank frauds like government and rbi ads telling us not to share our otps and passwords or click on links and so on so first of all the thing is there is very less 
awareness about cryptocurrency in india like while i was writing an article so i spoke to uh, people of different strata for example i spoke to a software engineer at the same time i spoke to a rich person who has lost some 1 crore rupees and at the same time i met a auto rickshaw driver who has invested in cryptocurrency so basically he doesn't know what cryptocurrency and how it works or how it operates so basically somebody has told him that if you are investing money in this there are high chances that you can double the money in very less time so i asked him when did you first invest so then he said that he invested during lockdown after his friend suggested so during lockdown they made good amount of money at that point of time but what happened was there are uh, several organized uh, crime syndicates which siphon money and then like cheat public at once for example in bangalore last year police had uh, cracked a gang who were uh, saying that they are investing money in cryptocurrency called helium so they were seeking investments and uh, they in fact were on uh, google play store as well so this company started uh, seeking investment in cryptocurrency and in no time these people had created 900 whatsapp groups they had their own people who used to post uh, screenshots of getting higher returns all these things in order to lure public so just to uh, relate so you are getting messages of people investing uh, 100 rupees and getting 200 rupees or uh, 300 rupees in less than 15 20 minutes so if you are getting that obviously you will be lured so then people started investing the firm had collected about 20 crore of money in less than 3 or 4 months so then one day they took out their application from the google play store and all the whatsapp groups were shut down so the police then found out that uh, this was the gang which was operating at the behest of somebody else and they had siphoned all the money and uh, the police find these cryptocurrency things as like a big challenge and what is the reason that this is such a big challenge for the police so first of all there is no regulation for cryptocurrency in india though the government now has asked to has regulated still it is in the initial stages so the usage of fake sim cards fake bank accounts and uh, using vpn addresses so all these things makes it very complex for the police to act on these uh, cyber criminals and also the jurisdiction for example if there is a physical crime uh, of cheating robbery there will be a specific place and you can at least have a idea of where the accused or the suspect could be but when it comes to cyber crime it can be anywhere across the globe person can be sitting in any country or outside the country or any country so there will be lack of coordination between the agencies to track down uh, these cyber criminals and in the end we speak about a report by the US state department which flagged human rights issues in india published on monday the 2022 annual us report on human rights practices across the world has flagged significant human rights issues in india that includes targeting of religious minorities gender based violence persecution of journalists and restriction on freedom of expression among other issues the report mentioned and i quote a lack of accountability for official misconduct persisted at all levels of government unquote and as per the report this lack of accountability is contributing to widespread impunity the report also flagged quote lack of investigation of and accountability for gender based violence including domestic and intimate partner violence sexual violence workplace violence child early and forced marriage femicide and other forms of such violence and lacks enforcement a shortage of trained police officers and an overburdened and under-resourced court system contributed to a low number of convictions unquote the us state department cited supreme court panel report terming the encounter of four accused in the 2019 telangana gang rape and murder case fake and said there were reports the government or its agents committed arbitrary or unlawful killings 
including extrajudicial killings of suspected criminals and terrorists. The report listed out torture and other inhuman treatment, stating that there were credible reports that confirmed that government officials employed them despite the country's laws saying otherwise, and that many NGOs reported how authorities used torture to coerce confessions. It also pointed out overcrowding in prisons, terming the conditions of jail as life-threatening due to inadequate sanitary conditions and lack of medical care. The department mentioned about reports of arbitrary arrests under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, Armed Forces Special Powers Act and Public Safety Act and stated that the judicial system of India remained seriously overburdened and lacked modern case management systems often leading to delaying or denying justice. Citing journalist Siddiq Kappan's case, the report said although Kappan was granted bail by the Supreme Court in a UAPA case two years after his arrest in 2020, activist Atikur Rehman, who was also arrested along with him during their travel to Hathras following a Dalit woman's rape case, continued to be in custody till the end of the year despite reports of severe medical conditions. The report also mentioned about violence in conflict areas and said its intensity, however, continued to decline. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was hosted by me, Rahil Filipos, and written and produced by Ucha Sarmin with the help of Shashank Pargav and Anvati Singh. It was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think would like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet at us at at the rate express podcast and write to us at podcast at the rate indianexpress.com.